Okay, uh, thank you very much, Tom, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Daniel Romero Alvarez. I am from Ecuador. And today I am going to uh, talk about what can be the summary of my entire research, which is unveiling the zoonotic and environmental potential of leprosy transmission. Um, this is stopped working again. <laughs> Okay, so whenever I am start talking about infectious diseases, I love to uh, show this painting, which is a portrait of our society in 1562. This painting is called The Triumph of Death and was painted by Pieter Brugel, but it's also called The Elder. And it's a portrait of our society because uh, regardless of social status, economic position, infectious diseases are always there hunting human societies. In this painting, you can see the symbol of death, which are these white skeletons, um, which is the classic symbol of infectious diseases. And this agent can take the form of many pathogens. And in this particular talk, it will take the form of Mycobacterium lepre, which is the pathogen causing leprosy. So in this changing world, Anthropogenic alterations of the ecosystems allow pathogens to move from wildlife to human societies. And this is happening because pathogens live naturally in ecosystems in wildlife. But whenever there is uh, unthought deforestation, excessive ag agriculture, unthought mining, then pathogens need to find other sources to live and then that is why they jump into us. We understand now that approximately 70% of all infectious diseases are from a zoonotic origin. So in this talk, I am, I am going to go through these five points. First, I will set the stage of what is currently known about leprosy. Then I will walk through the three chapters of my research, and then we will finish with some interesting conclusions. So in order to set the stage, I will present you the three main protagonists of this story, which is the disease, leprosy, the pathogens causing it, and what we know about transmissibility. First character, the disease. So leprosy is a very ancient pathology. It, 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 it was recorded since biblical times, and depending on the immuno, immunological factors of the host, it can manifest itself as a very mild disease with very uh, uh, easy to treat lesions, right? Like, for example, hypopigmentations on the skin. Or it can manifest in the severe form that is called lepromatous leprosy, which is uh, the form of the disease that we know from popular culture, right? The one that is very disabilitating for the patient, the one that can make uh, a patient be blind, that can make the patient to lose fingers popular symbol of leprosy. Um, so, although we know that immunology is, uh, it has something to do with the, this manifestation, it is not clear whether a particular patient is going to develop a very mild form of the disease or a very severe form of the disease. In this map, published in 1891, you can see the distribution of what we understood was leprosy at that time. Um, the arrows, the arrows here are pointing important uh, places that are showing high prevalences of leprosy. So you can see that it's mainly concentrated in tropics. Um, however, look this arrow in Norway, so totally a different ecosystem. During this time, Norway was the place with the higher incidence of leprosy. Um, and as a matter of fact, leprosy was discovered there, like the pathogen caused in leprosy. So this map is it's showing what we know about the disease Nowadays, in 2022, by the World Health Organization, and you, you can see that some of those arrows still highlight the places where the majority of leprosy cases are reported today, which is with Brazil, India, and Indonesia. And interestingly, interestingly, we don't have more cases in Norway. If you talk with a medical doctor about leprosy, and this happened in Ecuador, like, hey, what do you think about the incidence of leprosy in this country? 
they answer like, ah, but leprosy has been eradicated. And this, that is very interesting because at the end there is no awareness of how these diseases are still prevalent, even here, right? In 2022, around 136 patients were reported in the US. So, second character of this story, the pathogen. Here I am talking about Mycobacterium lepre. This pathogen has certain characteristics that make doing research on it very difficult. Among them, it is an obligate intracellular bacillus, so that means that it cannot survive outside its host. And different to all other Mycobacterium species, it's the only one that is a non cultivable bacteria on microbiological, but my, microbiological medium, meaning that you cannot do microbiology experiments to actually understand super important features of a pathogen, such as transmission dynamics, in order to understand how this bacteria is transmitted or how it is work in, in real life, we have relied on animal models, specifically infecting armadillos and also infecting mice. And that is the only way the bacteria has been studied until today. The other two important features is that is the slowest growing bacteria among the Mycobacterium genus, so it is those really it grows really slowly, like super slowly. Uh, the replication time can go from 12 to 14 days, which makes the pathogen super, super slow to grow. And then all the Mycobacterium genus, including Mycobacterium lepre, has this extremely thick cell wall composed with mycolic acids, and that is why it's called Mycobacterium. And this protects the bacteria against normal antibiotic treatments. So, because you cannot culture um, Mycobacterium lepre in microbiological medium, we have started understanding some important features of the pathogen uh, when the genomic, when the genome of Mycobacterium lepre was published. And this study published in 2010 collected around 200 strains of Mycobacterium lepre across the world and compared them among each other. And then they, they discovered three important points Mycobacterium lepre has the smallest genome in the family with 3.27 million base pairs. And these 200 strains share a similarity of 99.995% across the entire world. However, we have leveraged the very small difference of Silva.005 to subclassify the bacteria in four SNP types and also 14 subtypes. Then, in, in 28, this happened. Two Mexican patients died from leprosy. And when, they, when, they, when the researchers tried to find the causing pathogen, they realized that instead of Mycobacterium leprae being the agent causing leprosy, they found a Mycobacterium with 9.1% difference with Mycobacterium leprae. After five years of this publication, the leprology field accepted that leprosy is also caused by a new agent, Mycobacterium lepromatosis. And this is also something that usually nobody is aware. So leprosy is caused by two pathogens, right? With the recently discovered Mycobacterium lepromatosis. Surprisingly enough, this bacteria was found causing leprosy-like illness in red squirrels in the British Isles. So, the third main character of this story, what we know about transmission. Classically, we understand leprosy as a human-to-human -human transmitted pathogen, from infected individuals to susceptible individuals. However, starting in the 80s, uh, armadillos in wildlife were found to host Mycobacterium lepre. And a super important study published in 2011 demonstrated that the same strain that circulates in armadillos was also circulating in human beings. And they, of course, test tested the possibility of this zoonotic transmission of leprosy. As I mentioned before, mycobacterium lepromatosis was found and uh, infecting red squirrels, and red squirrels have like uh, they are transmitting the bacteria between themselves, so they have established a cycle of infection in their population. However, they receive the pathogen from human. This has also happened with non-human primates, uh, involving Suleiman Gavis, macaques, and chimpanzees. 
uh, but they have also received the bacteria from humans. And also, we know that if you go to a le leprosy colony, for example, and you collect soil samples or water samples, then you will find the Mycobacterium leprae there, but not a dead bacteria, a living repli replicative organism. So the environment might serve as a reservoir as well. So, however, from where the bacteria is coming from originally, in 2021, this very interesting study uh, followed two populations of chimpanzees that developed leprosy. One population was hosting the Mycobacterium leprae strain that was expected for Africa, and that was also circulating among humans there. However, the other population was hosting a strain that was totally unexpected in Africa, that was, was never discovered there. So potentially they got it, that population of chimpanzees from an environmental source. So notice the plot that is depicted to your left. <laughs> um, this plot is fundamental to this talk because of three things. First, it was published in the 90s. Uh, that is 10 years after the World Health Organization introduced a fantastic antibiotic regime that can actually fight leprosy very well. However, although you can see this decrease on prevalence of uh, human infected patients, right? The bars at the bottom are showing that the detection of new cases, so the incidence of new detection case rate, was never affected. We had a very good antibiotic regime to treat leprosy, but new cases were showing up. Uh, and this, of course, was published in the 90s, but this is the situation that we can see until today. Um, so that is super sad. <laughs> um, one of the things uh, that put me into this research path is that we do not know how leprosy is actually transmitted. What we know is that if someone gets the disease, it has to be exposed for a very long time to the source. And this very long time is something, it's a parameter that we don't know. It can be weeks, it can be months. Um, theoretically, this pathogen can be airborne transmitted or contact transmitted because a large concentration of the bacteria can be found in the air mucosa of the hosts and also on the ulcers, on the damage of the skin. Then we know that armadillo is a risk factor. So people manipulating the animal, it's actually, uh, it has a higher risk of infection. And also the environment is doing something that we don't know. So as you saw, this information has been accumulated in the last 10 years. And here you can see the manual of the World Health Organization, which is a guideline to control leprosy in the world and it's called towards zero leprosy. And you might expect that all this information has been included in the manual, right? The science and public health work together, and that is not the case. If you read this manual in detail, you will find that they only focus on human transmissibility, that they barely touch the topic of zoonotic infection in southern US. It is extremely surprising that across the manual, they never mention the presence of this other agent causing leprosy, Mycobacterium lepromacosis, and of course they don't say a word about the environment. So that uh, this lack of knowledge in public health organization and the lack of understanding of transmission is the main reason why this research exists. So we start with chapter one, museum specimens. Here you can see well, what we accept as the main host of Mycobacterium leprae is the nine-banded armadillo, which is the Cipus noventcintus. And in pink, you can see its distribution. This armadillo can live from Uruguay to central US. And notice this picture. This armadillo roadkill um, was, was found in, in Maastricht, in South Park. Potentially, some of you actually saw the armadillo. And potentially, this is the first site of nine-banded armadillo here in Lawrence. Um, so, across its distribution, nine banded armadillos infected with Mycobacterium leprae has been found in the United States, in Mexico very recent, recently, in Colombia, in Brazil, and in Argentina. So, how can we test 
whether other nine banded armadillos populations are infected. So that is when we decided to uh, look uh, information about the presence of armadillo tissues in open databases, specifically Birnet and Arctos, and then we noticed that these 10 museums were hosting tissues of armadillos. We asked for the tissues, sent us the tissues. We managed to gather 159 armadillo tissues from at least seven species. And you can see in the maps that is kind of geographically comprehensive, uh, encompassing multiple regions of South America. Uh, because these tissues were not intended to be a part of an infectious disease project, so the tissues were super heterogeneous. We have livers, we have spleens, we have lungs. Um, and they were preserved with different methods, right? The oil, frozen, stuff like that. So a very heterogeneic, heterogeneic sample. Um, the oldest the sample came from 1974. The newest came from 2017. In red are the positives that we found. The majority of positives uh, were found in 2013. But more importantly, here is the geographic distribution of positives and negatives. In total, from the 159 tissues, 122 belong to uh, nine banded armadillos, and from them, we found 18 positives, 16 in North America, and two in South America. And these South American identifications of Mycobacterium lepre in armadillos are the first um, realizations of the presence of the bacteria in Bolivia and Paraguay, in armadillos from those countries. Um, overall, then, we said that the prevalence is of 14.8% of Mycobacterium lepre across these samples. Um, so, as I was mentioning before, Mycobacterium lepre can be classified in types and subtypes. Uh, from these uh, 18 positives, we were able to identify 13 at the species level, so Mycobacterium lepre. Um, five were able to be identified at the subtype level, so sample 3i. And we were able to find two genes. And when this happened, I was very kind of disappointed, right? Because from 18 samples, only two genomes, I was kind of like. But I was working with the world experts here. And this information will come in handy later. Um, you can see there, what we accept is the phylogenetic uh, tree of around 300 genomes of Mycobacterium lepre in colors are different branches. The genomes that we collected belong to the branch 3i and they cluster together with other genomes of armadillos and with other uh, genomes of Mycobacterium lepre in humans. It was super nice to find that at least one of our genomes from an armadillo collected in 1996 um, was also clustering here, demonstrating the presence of this zoonotic pathway of transmission at least 30 years before that Paramount publication in 2011. Um, yeah, so this research was published in the Emerging Infectious Disease Journal, and there is a podcast that you can hear about this research if you are interested. And also, I published a piece, a scientific communication piece in the conversation, and also in Spanish in my blog. So you can go ahead and review. So I am from Ecuador, so the next logical question is, if the armadillos are living there, what is happening in my country? So, Ecuador is a beautiful place. It's divided in three ecoregions by the Andean mountain range, the coast, the Andean mountains, and the Amazonian region. And rural communities in Ecuador and multiple places of Latin America are using the nine-banded armadillo as a cultural item, right, to create these bats, and also to create musical instruments. And they are also uh, using the armadillo as a protein source. And during this uh, work, I was able to taste the nine-banded armadillo, and I don't like it at all. <laughs> Potentially, people like it, but I don't. Um, so in order to obtain armadillo tissues from different regions in Ecuador, we put together a network of hunters and communities that were willing to work with us in order to uh, see if they were hosting Mycobacterium lepre. So you can see uh, in the map of Ecuador the, uh, all the points where we managed to find armadillos, right? And because there, there is no information about, there is no so many publications about the taxonomic status of armadillos in Ecuador, 
So we also applied molecular tools to actually differentiate the species that were collected. This was also very important because at the end, uh, this was not a, a, a scientific expedition going to collect the mammoth. Is what it was the hunters like we need to okay we want to eat armadillo this weekend so they collected it and then they told us like hey we got an armadillo so we didn't know almost nothing about the potential species that was collected so here are some results uh, about the armadillo species that participated in this study we found 40 nine banded armadillos and they are represented by the orange triangles well red reddish triangles. Um, we found one Cabazo centralis, represented by the yellow spot in the northern part of Ecuador, and also another species, Dasicus pastasai, in the eastern side of Ecuador, represented by that cross. And then we found at least six armadillos that were not able to identify using this molecular tool. Mm. And then what about the distribution of Mycobacterium lepre? Here you can see the positives in red and the negatives in blue. You can see that there, there's a lot of positives. First, all of those positives are distributed across the country. And then we found that half of the nine banded armadillos were positives for Mycobacterium lepre. The only Lacipus pastasae species was positive for Mycobacterium lepre. And then two of six of the un, uh, unknown uh, armadillo species were also positives. And then this gave us an overall prevalence of 47.9%. So basically, a lot of armadillos are infected. In both research, and I have forgotten to mention this, in chapter one and chapter two, we found a zero prevalence of the other pathogen of Mycobacterium leprematosis. And I believe that there was in the slides that I totally forgot. <laughs> so remember the other detail that I, I, I highlighted before. So here we found 23 positive armadillos. And these were not museum specimens, meaning that they were not old samples. They were really fresh. We collected these samples between 2021 and 2022. So you might expect that it was super like, straightforward to obtain uh, uh, the sub-taxonomic levels of Mycobacterium lepre. However, we couldn't do it. So we couldn't identify subtypes and we couldn't identify genes. Here is when I understood that the fact that in the previous chapter we obtained two genomes were actually something to celebrate a lot. <laughs> so even with fresh samples, getting full genomes of Mycobacterium lepre is a nightmare. So super sad there. The start of this project was intended to find the zoonotic link in Ecuador of leprosy transmission, but we failed about that. However, we are still trying to get newer armadillos and trying to actually complete this research. Um, so with all the information that has been gathered through chapter one and chapter two, we decided to use ecological tools to understand the potential distribution of Mycobacterium leprosy. So, this slide is very important because during the uh, making of chapter three, I discovered this curious paper published in 1981 that was quoting this research from 1910, right? Mycobacterium lepre was discovered in 1973. And as far as 1910, Dr. Sun, in this second leprosy congress in Bergen, Norway, suggested that potentially Mycobacterium lepre was transmitted by indirect sources, not necessarily from other humans. So this idea is super old. Um, and regarding what we currently know about indirect transmission, environmental transmission of Mycobacterium lepre, this fantastic study published in 2014 demonstrated that being an obligatory intracellular pathogen, Mycobacterium lepre found that it can live super happy inside amoebas and maintain its virulence factor even if the amoeba uh, uh, is exposed to very unfavorable conditions, right? And also this paper basically isolated Mycobacterium lepre and put it in petri dishes and then just leave it there to see what happens, right? So they put the petri dish in the freezer and then they expose the bacteria to minus 20 Celsius degrees. And also they just leave the petri dish for five months in, in humid conditions 
And then in both studies, they isolated the bacteria again, infect mice with it, and then the mice develop what we expected for a leprosy infection. So the bacteria was able to survive outside the host and was keeping their virulence factors. So then a lot of publications, especially in India and French Guyana, have also uh, tested the presence of microbacterium leprosy in soils, water, um, as a replicative bacteria, right? And so there's a lot of paper. That was the point of this thing. Um, and something very curious also to share regarding these indirect sources of microbacterium leprosy transmission is that in vitro, it has been proved that microbacterium leprosy can live in ticks and they can be horizontally and vertically transmitted. So mom tick can transmit microbacterium leprosy to eat tick, and then they can also transmit microbacterium leprosy to rabbits. So microbacterium leprosy might be everywhere. <laughs> okay, so then uh, in order to develop, to understand the distribution of microbacterium leprosy, we put together some ecological niche models. The core behind ecological niche modeling is what we understand as the Hutchinson duality, which means that a particular point in geography can be represented by multiple points, but by mu multiple environmental conditions, being temperature, humidity, um, vegetation indexes. And on the contrary, one point in the environment, let's say 23 Celsius degrees, can be manifested in multiple points in geography. That is why it's called a duality. And this fantastic plot demonstrates that very gracefully. So you can see in the map of South America that there are three cities there, Quito, Guayaquil from Ecuador, and Rio de Janeiro from Brazil. You can see that Guayaquil, geographically speaking, is super far from Rio de Janeiro. But if you transform this map on temperature and precipitation axis, then you can see how Guayaquil and Rio de Janeiro are, are very close together. So in order to put together these models, we rely on two experiments. In each of them, we use this basic three uh, strategies we use as geographic points, the uh, identifications of Mycobacterium leprae in the seafood species. We use as environmental variables, determinants of temperature, humidity, soils, and vegetation. And then we use three algorithms, convex schools, one class, four vector machines, and Maxent. And the first question that we say, so something that is very challenging with these models is to actually evaluate them and test if they are actually doing what they are supposed to do. So we have this very interesting independent data set of points, which was the collection of samples from Ecuador. So basically, we calibrated the models from identifications of microbacterium leprae in armadillos in the Americas, and then put together the models and see whether they can predict what we found already in Ecuador. And the, these are some results. So. Uh, convex schools were able to predict only 25% of our observations. Um, one class four vector machines were able to predict 75% of our detections. And Maxen was able to predict 100% of our detections. Uh, in order to gather the majority of useful information across these models, we put together an ensemble, which is the last panel. And theoretically, future research can be directed there. Something that I like to mention here is that Maxen is showing a 100% of detection, predicting that the entire country is good for the bacteria, which I believe is kind of not informative because we are losing a lot of specificity, right? If something says that everything can be happening, then it's like saying nothing. So for me, a good, a good, for me, the one class per vector machine is kind of a good balance, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so then uh, the second experiment was doing the same thing, but the question was not only uh, focus on Ecuador, but focus on the entire world. In order to do that, uh, we, uh, well, I put together what I like to call the most comprehensive set of points where Mycobacterium leprae has been identified in non-human sources, which you can see here. And all the characters that have been in a way or in another discussed during this talk are present here. So in West Africa, you can see the chimpanzees that we talked at the beginning. Um, in, you can see the red squirrels in the red islands, right? And you can see also um, the environmental isolations in Northern India. And what we did here is to calibrate the model with the red points. 
and then project the models to the world and see if they can anticipate the blue points. So some results. In, ah, okay, so in these plots, in order to complete what we were doing, we also put together models using the entire set of points. So the models calibrated with the C plus occurrences are in red, and the ones calibrated with what the ones developed with all the points are in gray. So one algorithm was able to predict 48% of points, the other 52% of points, the other 57% of points. So they were not doing a great job. Um, I learned through this particular exercise how Maxen, which is a very popular algorithm to do these models, extrapolates vastly. So if you compare uh, the plot, you can see how Maxen is like predicting like largely. Um, okay, so as we did in Ecuador, we put together the information that all these algorithms were agreeing with in order to suggest what what is the potential distribution of mycobacterium leprae in non-human sources. And as I mentioned before, the models were not doing the best job ever. However, some interesting things that we can learn from this distribution is that, remember that in chapter one, for the first time, I found the presence of mycobacterium leprae in Bolivia and Paraguay. So the model suggests also areas of Bolivia and Paraguay uh, to be good sources of non yeah. uh, for, for yeah. non-human leprosy. So this is a second line of evidence suggesting that we should do some research there. Um, sadly, the models failed to predict the presence of the red squirrels infected and also the environmental sources in India. And also they failed to do a good prediction in Indonesia. So uh, some conclusions regarding all these research. So first, ecological niche models in absence of information are doing a good job in terms of informing an uh, evidence guide decision to see where we can find this, where, where we can find non-human sources of leprosy. However, potentially the models are, are, are failing because we don't have enough information about Mycobacterium leprae in our okay. yeah. And this is basically a consequence of lack of awareness of leprosy being in other places rather than only in humans. So then uh, we saw this map before. Thanks to this research, we added the blue triangles on the map. Um, we found this 14.8% in chapter one of prevalence of Mycobacterium leprae in armadillos, 47.9% of Mycobacterium leprae in Ecuadorian armadillos. And thanks to the two genomes that we found, we anticipate that the potential zoonotic transmission of leprosy was uh, happening in the US at least 30 years before it was accepted. And then it is super important to mention that across this study, we never found mycobacterium lepromatosis, the other agent of leprosy. So remember that plot. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, we knew that this stable detection of new cases is happening until now. And as as we have discussed throughout this talk, there is at least 20 years of evidence demonstrated that leprosy is a, it's a non-specific human pathogen, that it can live beyond human beings. However, this information is not included. In my view, public health institutions are having this veil on their eyes that do not allow them to include research on the development of their guidance. And this is happening because the huge gap between research and public health. And only by bridging that gap closer is that guidelines will be actually useful for stuff. Um, only by accepting that leprosy transmission is a very complex phenomenon, public health institutions will be able to actually develop guidelines to control the disease and avoid further suffering to the people affected by it. Thanks. Uh, what do we do now? Do we have